Good morning, everyone. I like to uh, say it's good to see uh, everyone here this morning. Ray's with us this morning. That's great. We haven't seen him in a while. He's been feeling bad, and so it's great to have him here. We've got visitors, and we've got uh, people that have, haven't been with us, at least when I was here before. And so it's great to have, have you here as we worship together. Um, so this morning, to get us started, I'm going to read a few verses from Matthew 5. And in this, Jesus is talking about us as Christians and what we should be thinking of ourselves as. You are the salt of the earth. But if the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot. So you are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on, a, on its stand, and it gives light to everyone in the house. In that same way, let your light shine before others, that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. So when we think about our Christian life, we've got to think of ourselves as the light of the world. We have the truth. We have what everyone in this world needs. We have that light. And it should be shining out of ourselves so that others can see that. And why do we do that? To glorify God. That's what it says at the very end. That's why we do it. To glorify Him and His Son. So this morning, <clears throat> we're going to sing. Uh, last week we sung, and I, I sing songs about a lot about Jesus, and we're going to continue that very same thing again um, because of what he's done for us. <clears throat> Our first song, and the, the songs will be up here, but if you do want to look in your song books, the, the book number is there. Um, the first song we're going to sing is, I Have Decided to Follow Jesus. And that's the first thing uh, that we do uh, have to make a choice in, in our lives. When we believe in it, we have to decide to do something about that belief. And I think that's where we start at. We believe, and then we have to decide to do something about that. <clears throat> I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back, no turning back. The world behind me, the cross before me. The world behind me, the cross before me. The world behind me, the cross before me. No turning back. Yeah. 
Jesus, just to trust His cleansing blood, just in simple faith to plunge me neath the healing cleansing flood. Jesus, Jesus, how I trust Him, how I proved Him more and more. Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus, oh, for grace to trust Him more. Yes, tis sweet to trust in Jesus, just from sin and self to cease. Just from Jesus simply taking life and rest and joy and peace. Jesus, Jesus, how I trust Him, how I proved Him more and more. Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus, oh, for grace to trust Him more. I'm so glad I learned to trust Thee, precious Jesus, Savior, friend. And I know that Thou art with me, will be with me to the end. Jesus, Jesus, how I trust Him, how I proved Him more. Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus, oh, for grace to trust Him more. Karen? Would you pray for me, please? Our most gracious and loving Heavenly Father, we come before your throne of grace and mercy this morning, thanking you for another day of life and your watchful care over through the night giving us this opportunity once again to be able to come into your midst and worship you, Father. We do love you, O Father, so much because you taught us how to live by giving us your, our Savior, your Son, to go to that cross, to take the sins of the world upon him. You taught us how to love. And we thank you, Jesus, once more. We can't say it enough that going to that cross and taking the sins of the world upon you and giving us the new, this new covenant with our Father in heaven because of you, and we are so blessed that we now have the remission of sin and the opportunity of everlasting life in heaven one day with you. We pray in this day, Father, that, that everything that we do and say will be in accordance with thy holy will. And we pray, Father, that the lesson that Brother Ryan is going to bring to us today, that we will be able to use it in our daily walk of faith. We pray now, Father, you continue to be with us in this worship service. Continue to bless each and every one of us for being here. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Amen. Our next song will be more about Jesus. More about Jesus, what I know. More of His grace to others show. More of His saving for the sea. More of His love.
you prepare our minds for the Lord's Supper this morning, we're going to sing, I am thine, O Lord, before we take it that Lord's Supper. And when you, as we're singing this song, try to think about the words that we're singing and sing it from the heart, knowing that without Christ, we would still be lost, just like the rest of the world is. But we have Christ in our lives now. And we are His. And that's this song says, I am thine, O Lord. That tells Jesus and God that we're His and His family. <clears throat> I am thine, O Lord. I have heard thy voice. And it told thy love to me. But I long to rise in the arms of and be closer drawn to Thee. Draw me nearer, nearer, blessed Lord, to the cross where Thou hast died. Draw me nearer, 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 blessed Lord, to Thy precious bleeding side. Consecrate me now to thy service, Lord, by the power of grace divine. Let my soul look up with a steadfast hope, and my will be lost in thine. Draw me nearer, nearer, blessed Lord, to the cross where disciples on the road to Aeneas. He tells us that Jesus is alive. When he opens Acts, Luke tells us again that he is alive. He doesn't make a great point of it, but he just makes that comment. The faith of the apostles, the faith of the first century church was based on that fact that Jesus is alive. And when you think about it, it is our basis of our faith as well, that Jesus is alive. 
We're told many times in, in Acts that, that Luke tells us that Christ is alive, that he was raised from the dead, that he says that we are witnesses, the apostles are witnesses. Paul himself said that in three different places in Acts that Christ appeared to him alive. And that's what, that was the basis of, Christ, of Paul's understanding and his faith in Christ. It's his faith in the church. It's what led him to become the teacher of the Gentiles. Jesus is alive. The witnesses that we have in the Scripture give us that same kind of faith. That we have the belief, the understanding that Jesus Christ is alive. And because of that, we have that hope that is in us as well, that we can have that home in heaven with God. I think that's something that we need to truly remember. And this memorial service that we are about to partake of is very much a part of helping us to constantly remember that Jesus Christ is alive. His death was no different from any other person on the earth except the way that it took place. He died. All of those people in, in, that we know, that we read about in, in the Scripture, they've all died. What makes Christ especially special for us and for those early Christians is that He was raised from the dead. That's what we're remembering when we partake of the Lord's Supper. That God raised Christ from the dead. And in so doing, He made that promise for us that He can raise us from the dead as well. Christ, it says, was the first fruit of, of the death, of the raising of the dead. He is the proof that we are going to also be raised from the dead if we can recognize and remember our relationship with God. Let's give thanks. Let's pass out the cup and then we'll give thanks for the cup. But Brett, I get it right. Man. Well, I mean, I guess we can do what you said right there. <laughs> thanks for the bread. Father in heaven, we come unto you at this time recognizing that you are God, that you're the creator of this universe that we have. Father, we are blessed by all the blessings that you give us, and especially, Father, we're blessed by the death of Christ on the cross that we can have that home in heaven with you. We know, Father, that you raised him from the dead. And by doing that, you have promised us that we can be raised as well. We give thanks, Father, for what he's done for us, what you have done for us, the love that's been shown to us. We pray in the name of Christ. Thank you. Amen. Amen. God, we want to come before you again and thank you for the sacrifice of your son, for the blood that he shed for us, the blood that 
covers us over, that, that wipes away our sins, makes us clean in your sight, and makes it possible for us to be resurrected, to live with you eternally after this death in this life. We just ask at this time that we would take this, this juice in a way that would give honor to that blood, that would give honor to that sacrifice, and to look the love that underpinned the sacrifice of your Son on our behalf. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. physical blessings as well you know we can we can look at the lives that we have and, and, and I'm not trying to diminish the difficulties that we that many of us have faced in our physical lives but I think if we can if we can truly look at the blessings that God has given to us and recognize that that even with the difficulties we may have on a daily basis and with our lives and our families and our work and the COVID and everything else that we're faced, we're still blessed by God. And we want to take this opportunity in a physical way to show our appreciation to God by returning to Him a portion of those blessings, those physical blessings that He has given to us. Let's give thanks for those blessings. Father in heaven, we thank you for all the physical blessings that you've given us. We know, Father, that everything that we have comes from you. Father, we owe our very lives to you and we express our appreciation for the blessings that you have given to us. Father, as we consider those blessings, help us to recognize our responsibility to return a portion of those physical blessings to you as a part, as, as our return to you of the funds that you have given to us. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. <laughs> Thank 
So, we have been talking for a number of weeks about baptism, but the last couple of weeks we, I went off on some other topics because, well, I get to decide. So, um, went off on a couple of other topics, talking about some things that I thought were kind of important end of year and new year things to talk about. We're going to get back to baptism today, and we're going to continue on with that for several weeks as we explore some of the more um, important and, and sometimes maybe overlooked concepts or ideas relating to baptism. Um, the tendency, I think, a lot of times for us in churches, we say, you know, um, it, you know, it says baptize, so we're going to baptize people, and we don't really necessarily stop and think about the significance of baptism and what's really going on, and some of what goes into that. And today we're going to be talking about one of the things that that's sort of a precursor or predecessor to actually being baptized, and that's belief. But let's start with our core passage. We've looked at this every week, and I want to remind us again about this over in John chapter three. Where Jesus, or rather, it says there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews, and this man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you have come from God as a teacher, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. Jesus answered and said to him, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. And Nicodemus said to him, How can a man be born when he is old? He cannot enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born, can he? Jesus answered, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Do not be amazed that I said to you, you must be born again. I've said this before. We're gradually unpacking this, but... We're, right now, we're kind of focused on unpacking the part about being born of water. And we're going to talk about baptism of the Spirit as well as we go through this process because both of these things are a component of what makes us Christians, what makes us saved, what makes us Christ's disciples. And we can't ignore either one if we want to be the disciples that Christ expects of us. And we're sometimes more hesitant to talk about the baptism of the Holy Spirit because, you know, pretty soon somebody wants to start speaking in tongues or whatever. But... But the reality is that that's every bit as important as the baptism in water. And so we're going to look at those things as we go through this. But today I want us to take a look at a passage that is one of our favorite passages when we're trying to, to argue in favor of the importance of baptism. And rightly so, it's over in Mark chapter 16, where Jesus says to his disciples, Go into all the world and preach the gospel to all creation. He who has believed and has been baptized shall be saved, but he who has disbelieved shall be condemned. And it's important because we see, to recognize, we see two components here. We see that he says, he who has believed and has been baptized shall be saved. So, so baptism, for it to be successful, useful, requires belief. And then he says, but he who has disbelieved shall be condemned. You notice he's going to say, he who has disbelieved and not been baptized, because what's the point of getting into the baptism thing? If you don't even believe in the first place, why would you even want to bother with being baptized? So he's talking about belief leading to baptism. And I want to remind us of what we talk about when we talk about faith. Faith is action. Faith is doing something based on your belief. And at the core of Christianity is this belief, faith, 
that leads to action, being baptized. But today we want to talk about belief. We want to talk about what it means to believe when it comes to the Christian walk, and in particular in the context of baptism. Now I think it's important to take a look at the passage that we just read in the context that it was written in, because if you read that passage by itself, it's, it's useful, but if you read the whole passage, you start to get a picture of something a little bit bigger than just what's going on in the immediate command that Jesus gives the disciples. So over in Mark chapter 16, if we pick up uh, it, it, at the beginning of this part of the story, it says, after Jesus had risen early on the first day of the week, he first appeared to Mary Magdalene, from whom he had cast out seven demons. She went and reported to those who had been with him while they were mourning and weeping. Good news, Jesus is risen again. Great stuff. And the guy and all of the apostles said, wow, that's fantastic. We totally believe you, right? No. When they had heard that he was alive and had been seen by her, they refused to believe it. Good job, guys. That's what we're looking for out of the 12 guys that are going to spread, the 11 guys that are going to spread the gospel. They don't believe it. After that, he appeared in a different form to two of them while they were walking along on their way to the, to the country. And they went away and reported it to the others, but they did not believe them either. So they've got two different, well, actually three different witnesses who've all said Jesus is raised, and the remaining disciples are like, no, we don't think so. Probably not. We don't believe that. That's just too unlikely. The scripture continues and says, Afterward, he appeared to the eleven themselves as they were reclining at the table. And notice what he does there. The first thing he does when he shows up is it says he reproached them for their unbelief and hardness of heart, because they had not believed those who had seen him after he has risen. See, the thing is, Christianity is all about belief. And if you can't get the, five, the 11 guys who are the first followers to buy into that, you've got a problem, right? So he says to them, you, you've got to, to be believing. You've got to, you've got to believe. And, and, and you can't just believe because you see me. Because most of the people that you're going to convert are never going to have seen me resurrected. So if your belief is only based on what you see, that's not even belief. That's just observation. That's what scientists do. Scientists don't believe in stuff. They observe stuff. So he says, you've got to believe. You can't be so hard in your heart that you're unable to believe in something miraculous and something wondrous. Because if that's where you're at, how could you possibly expect to convince anybody else? And then he said to them, go into all the world and preach the gospel to all creation. He who has believed and has been baptized shall be saved, but he who has disbelieved shall be condemned. And I want us to recognize in that context, that's a lot more significant statement, isn't it? Because he's just gotten done dealing with a bunch of guys who didn't believe that he'd been raised and telling them, your unbelief is getting in the way of what I want from you. And then he says, and here's the key, everybody else is going to have to believe you. You telling them that I've been raised. They're not going to get to see me. They're going to have to believe you. So you better hope they do a better job than you did. I mean, that's, I mean we, we think about the, the, the apostles as kind of being these paragons, and they are in some ways, but at the same time, they're flawed, and this is one of their flaws. They failed to believe when it was first presented to them. He says, the good news is, you're not going to be doing this totally on your own, because I'm going to give you, I'm going to give you some, some empowerment so that people will believe you. He says, these signs will accompany those who have believed. In my name, they will cast out demons, and they will speak with new tongues, and they will pick up serpents. I mean, you could do that if you wanted to, but that wouldn't turn out as well for you. And if they drink any deadly poison, it will not hurt them. And they will lay hands on the sick and they will recover. So he says, the good news is that you're not going to just be going out and say, hey guys, guess what? We didn't believe it either, but it turns out Jesus is raised from the dead. He says, you're going to have signs that accompany you so that people will believe you by what you're believing what you're saying by being able to see this evidence of what you've done. And, well, we believe that those signs have passed away because of the more perfect, the revelation of the scriptures and the ability to show the gospel through the scriptures. The fact is that without those signs, it would have been pretty hard, I think, to convince people that they were legitimate. Because they didn't believe themselves. And that's, that's I think, we, we sometimes we're a little too hard on ourselves. I mean, I'm going to be kind of talking about how important it is to believe today, obviously. But we're kind of too hard on ourselves almost sometimes when we think about the weakness of our faith. Remember what Jesus said, you need the faith of the size of a mustard seed to cast a tree into the sea. That's pretty amazing when you think about it. Just a tiny little bit of faith. Belief is not easy. It's not easy. When we're little, little kids learn to believe in all sorts of stuff. Superman and Santa Claus and, you know, um, the, the fact that their parents are infallible and they gradually learn that those things just aren't true. <clears throat> But they believe in all those things, and when they're young, it's a lot easier for them to start to believe in God and to buy into that. I'm always amazed and appreciative of any adult who comes to Christ as an adult, because it's so much harder to believe when you're cynical and 
when you've seen how bad people are, and when you, when you don't really believe in the fantastical and the wondrous so much anymore. And that's what Jesus calls us to do, is to have at least a little bit of faith that will lead to that kind of action, to that kind of response. But when we talk about our belief, I want to look at three things that are important for us to understand in the context of belief that leads to baptism and salvation. And the first thing I want us to realize is that it matters who you believe in. It really does. It's kind of important. It, it, what's, what's disturbing is that, that the, the modern day mindset about this is it doesn't matter, I mean among religious people anyway, is it doesn't matter what you believe or who you believe in, it just matters that you believe something. And, we, and it, it speaks to how, how far our society has degenerated that the best you can hope for is to just get somebody who believes in something. You know, when the vast majority of our society just doesn't believe in anything and they live their lives however they want to, we're just happy if somebody will believe in something, you know. And so we have all these different new age kind of mindsets about, you know, you got to, you know, access your higher power and you can do it through all these different paths and all these different, these different teachers and all these different approaches. As long as you pick one, you can access that, that higher self and that, that higher consciousness or whatever it is we want to call it. It's not called God because God sounds a little bit too Christian. It's, it's all these different notions of higher powers and greater consciences and whatever else it is. But the thing is, that is not the Christian concept. And I hate to say this because this, this, this turns people off if they don't want to hear it, but the truth is that Jesus doesn't leave any wiggle room on this. Jesus does not give you any room to say that other people, other teachers are okay. Over in John chapter 14, Jesus says to the disciples when they're in that upper room near the end of his life, he says, do not let your heart be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many dwelling places. If there were not so, I would have told you for I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, and where I am, there you may be also. And you know the way where I am going. And Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are, where you are going. How do we know the way? And Jesus said to him, I am the way, and the truth, and the life. And I hope all of you know that passage, because it's literally written on our window. <laughs> no one comes to the Father but through me. No one comes to the Father but through me. I am the way. He's not, there's no equivocation about this. He's not saying, I am one of the ways, and one of the ways that you can get to the Father. I am the only way to the Father. And if you had known me, you would all know my Father also. From now on, you know him and you have seen him. He says, you can see God in me because I'm the way to God. Now, the thing that's interesting is he doesn't have to explain to them why it's important to know the way to the Father because these are good Jewish guys. And good Jewish guys know that the Father, that God, is the only way to salvation. I have to explain that here in this context, not so much because I don't think that you guys know that, but because if you're having a conversation about this down the road with somebody who doesn't believe that, that's kind of the first principle you have to establish. But Jesus, is, it's implicit in what he's saying here, that God is where you want to end up. That God is where salvation is. So even though Jesus doesn't explicitly say that in this passage, that is inherent in what he's saying. God is where you want to want to end up. And because God is where you want to end up, then the only way you can get there is through me. Because I am the way. I am the truth. Again, not one of many truths. Not one of several truths. I am the only truth. And I am the life. There is no spiritual life any other way. The thing about spirituality is that spirituality makes us feel good. It's kind of weird the way it does that. I've had missionaries come to my door and tell me that they'd like me to read a passage from their particular literature, and if I read the passage and I pray about it and I feel good about it, I should become a part of their church. And I explain to them that everybody feels good when they pray. Do you, do you, do you not think that, 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 that the Muslim who, who reads his scriptures and goes and prays doesn't feel good afterwards? I mean, if you felt lousy every time you read, read your scriptures, you'd probably stop believing in that, right? But, it's, but the, the reality is that, that every religion their followers feel good about their religion because they have positive experiences. But that's not because they've got the right truth. It's because when we try to fill that hole in us that needs God, that whatever we try to do, our human nature says, well, at least that's better than nothing. That's that original argument we're looking at. But it's not really true. We've just fooled ourselves into thinking that we feel that, that feeling good means that something good has happened. And so, of course, if I pray a prayer after I read their scripture, I'm going to feel good because I'm praying and reaching out to God. But when we actually reach out for God, Jesus says, I'm the only way to get there. I'm the only truth. And so, yeah, you might feel good about it if you pray to somebody else, 
or about something else, but the truth is you're not going to reach the Father unless you go through me. It matters who we believe in. And the apostles taught this as well. Over in Acts chapter 4, Peter and John, Acts chapter 3, they go to the, to the temple, they encounter a guy who's lame, he's asking for, begging for money, Peter and John don't have any money, but instead they heal him from his, his uh, lameness so he can walk again, which causes a huge stir because this guy goes running around talking about how he's been healed, and uh, the, the uh, Pharisees, the Sanhedrin, they get all worked up because apparently it's, you know, they want people getting healed at the temple. That would be weird and disruptive. And so they send out the guards and everything, and eventually Peter and John get arrested. Kind of not how you expect your day to go, you know. I went, to, I went to church and I healed somebody and then I got arrested for it. You know, it's not how the, the progression you normally expect. But they get arrested for it. They're held overnight. And the next day, the Sanhedrin convenes and they bring them out in front of them to try to figure out what's going on here. And it says, On the next day, the rulers and elders and scribes were gathered together in Jerusalem, and all who were of the high priestly descent were there. And when they had placed them, that's Peter and John in the center, they began to inquire, By what power or in what name have you done this? It's always kind of dangerous that we say this in law. You don't ask a question that you don't already know the answer to. This is the wrong question to ask because the last thing they wanted was these people to start talking about what they're going to start talking about. Because their response is that Peter is filled with the Holy Spirit. He says to them, rulers and elders of the people, if we are on trial today for a benefit done to a sick man, there's kind of some sarcasm there, by the way. If we're on trial because we healed a guy, well then, as to how this man has been made well, let it be known to all of you and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ the Nazarene, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by this name, this man stands here before you in good health. He is the stone which was rejected by you, the builders, but which became the chief cornerstone. Now, when he says that, that's not just a cute metaphor. The, the Sanhedrin will immediately recognize that that is a reference to prophecies about the Messiah. So he's saying, your own prophecies say, you weren't going to listen to this guy, and you're the ones they were talking about. But then he finishes with this. There is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven that has been given among men by which we must be saved. We have to recognize, and we have to be willing to teach and be honest with people when they ask us that, yeah, we believe there's only one way to God. If you try to hide that, if you try to, I, I've had a couple different people when I have talked to them about what we believe here at The Way and about the fact that I'm a minister, and they'll ask me, you know, now do you guys believe that, that, you know, that your religion is the only way to be saved? And my answer is no, I don't believe that my religion is the only way to be saved. I believe that Christ is the only way to be saved, and that there is no other way besides that one. And in, and in both cases, they said, well, let's, we don't want that. You know, we were looking for a little bit more open-mindedness. And that's unfortunate, but the reality is if I lied to them, and I said, yeah, sure, we, we believe that you know, there's lots of ways to be saved. Pretty soon they're going to come here and listen to me preach, and they're going to go, well, he lied to us. So I mean, you might as well be honest about it up front, right? Because one way or the other, unless they're idiots, they're going to figure out eventually that what we believe is that there is only one way. But that's what we've got to teach because that's the truth. There is only one way. And so it matters who you put your belief in. Amen. Because Jesus is the only answer to that question. The second thing we need to realize is that it matters what you believe about Jesus. It matters what you believe about Jesus. See, we saw one truth in there about what you believe about Jesus that Peter already mentioned in the speech before the Sanhedrin. He said, you crucified him. God raised him from the dead. Jerry talked about that during his Lord's Supper speak uh, a speech as well that it matters that we believe that Jesus was resurrected because if he just died everybody dies pretty much so if everybody dies there's nothing special about that even if he was he died for a purpose if that purpose wasn't fulfilled in his resurrection it's pretty meaningless and so it matters to believe that but there's another thing that's really important to believe that a lot of people don't want to believe see people want to believe that Jesus is a great teacher a great philosopher, a great moralist. They want to believe that he has all these good ideas, but they definitely don't want to believe that he's deity. They don't want to believe that he's the Messiah. They don't want to believe that he's God, because if he's God, it's not just his good ideas, it's the necessity of doing what he said. If he's just a teacher, just a philosopher, I can pick and choose what of his teachings and philosophies I want to believe in, and what of these other ones I want, and what other things I just want to do. I can create a sort of amalgamation of all these different ideas, and I can follow those, and that's totally okay, because they're all just teachings and moral ideas and philosophies, and there's no big deal. If God 
actual God comes and says, this is what I want, you don't get to say anymore, I think I'll pick some other things too, because you're kind of stuck with what God wants. And so when Jesus says, I am God, we have to deal with that. We can't just stop and say, okay, he's just a great teacher. We have to recognize the significance of his teachings. Over in John chapter 14, that passage we were looking at a little bit ago, the continuation of that, Philip says to, to Jesus after he said, I'm going um, to show you, you know, if you've seen the Father, you've, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Philip said to him, Lord, show us the Father, and it is enough for us. And I'm sure Jesus is like, dude, I just said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. But he says to him, have I been so long with you, and yet you have not come to know me, Philip? He who has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Do you not believe that I am in the Father, and the Father is in me? The words that I say to you, I do not speak on my own initiative, but the Father abiding in me does his works. Believe me that I am in the Father, and the Father is in me. Otherwise, believe because of the works themselves. Notice what he says here. He doesn't say, the words that I say to you, I do not speak out of my own initiative, but the Father tells me what to say. He says, the Father dwelling in me, the Father living in me, does his works. He says, I'm in the Father. He's equating himself with God. And there's other places where he's done this. This is hardly the only place. He is equating himself with God. He's making it explicitly clear that he is deity. That he's not just some man who came to teach. That he is deity. And he continues to say, and says this, Truly, truly, I say to you, he who believes in me, the works that I do, he will do also. And greater works than these he will do, because I go to the Father. Whatever you ask in my name, that I will do, so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. Who has the power to do anything? God. God. So when Jesus says, if you ask for anything in my name, I will do it, he's claiming the power of God, and there's no way to get around that unless you deliberately mistranslate the scripture the way that a few uh, groups of people have decided to do. He says, whatever you ask in my name, I will do it, so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask me anything in my name, I will do it. He's making it very clear that he and the Father are equal, that they are not, not while he's here on earth, but that ultimately his power and his authority is co-equal with God's. Because he is God, he is deity. And because he's deity, you can't just lump his teachings in with all the other great philosophers and teachers and moralists throughout history. His teachings are above that. Because of the direct revelation and the direct statements of God. And so it matters what you believe about Jesus. He can't just be a teacher or a philosopher if he's going to really be what the scriptures teach, what he says about himself. And this is the confession that he calls on his disciples to make over in Matthew chapter 16. It says, Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, and he's asking his disciples, who do people say that the Son of Man is? And they said, some say John the Baptist, and others Elijah, and still others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. There's all this, all this talk going on. Who is Jesus? Who is he? What's he doing? And it's kind of interesting because this is actually happening at a point when a lot of his followers have deserted him because he stopped feeding them for free. And because he started talking about eating his body and drinking his blood, and they got kind of creeped out. And so he, he's, he's kind of nervous because, I don't think he's not nervous, but that's not the right term for Jesus. But he's, he's trying to find out what the disciples are hearing, not so much what that really is being said because he knows what's being said. But he's getting them to think, who are people saying that I am? These are important people, John the Baptist and Elijah and Jeremiah, the prophets. These are significant men throughout history, moralists and teachers and philosophers. And so these people are equating Jesus with one of those people, and you'd think if that's what he was, he would have been happy with that. But that's not who he is, and so he's not happy with it. And instead he asks a question, he says, who do you say I am? And Simon Peter answered, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Now, Jesus truly was a great moralist, a great teacher, and he wasn't the Son of God. This would be the point at which he would say, no, 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 no. Because remember what Paul did, Paul and, and, and Barnabas did, when they were worshipped as gods in, in, I forget which of the cities they went to, they were worshipped as God. They immediately stopped the because they said, we're not gods. So, if, see, if Peter says, you're the Son of God, and he isn't, and he's a good man, the next thing he should be saying is, no, I'm not. No, no, you got that wrong. But that's not what he says. Jesus says, blessed are you. Simon Bar-Jonah, because flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. He says, bingo, you got it right. I am, in fact, the Son of God. Good work on you. It's interesting that that is the question we ask when we baptize people. Do you believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God? 
Well, I mean, we, there's a whole lot of questions we could have. We could have like a, a sheet, you know. Do you believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God? Do you believe that he died for your sins? Do you believe that he was resurrected? We don't ask all that. We just ask the one question. Do you believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God? Because the fact is that if you believe that, all, all the other stuff kind of folds into it. Because the things that he says about himself must be true if he's the Son of God, right? And the fact that he was resurrected, that makes sense because he's the Son of God. His resurrection is different than everybody else's. It's kind of an important thing to realize. Resurrections happened off and on all the time in the Old and New Testament. A number of people got resurrected. They weren't the Son of God. Some of them were women. They definitely weren't the Son of God. But Jesus' resurrection was different. It was, he was resurrected because he was the Son of God. He was resurrected by his power. In the scriptures, it's confusing because in one place they'll say it's his power, and then they'll say the Holy Spirit did it, and they'll say God the Father did it. And the key to realizing that is that that just redoubles the principle that Jesus is God. Because they're all linked together in this. And his resurrection came out of him being the Son of God. You can't kill the Son of God and expect him to stay dead. And so Jesus says, Blessed are you for recognizing who I am. And the confession that we give at baptism is Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. Because that's the core of the faith that we have. And also because Jesus goes on to say this, I also say to you that you are Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overpower it. That leads to a lot of confusion because in Greek those two words there are Peter which is Petros and rock which is Petra and so Peter is actually he actually is literally calling him I say to you that you are a rock at least he didn't say you are dumb as a rock that would have been really insulting but he said you are a rock and upon this rock I will build my church but he used two different words for rock so it's important to realize that he's not saying I'm going to build my church on you Peter because if anything, you would make the argument that Paul was the guy who had the most to do with actually building the church in terms of the number of people he reached. But that's not the important thing. He says, this rock, Petra, I will build my church. He's talking about the confession, the belief that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. If you believe that, that is the core of the church. That is the core upon which the church is built, is that belief among the followers of Jesus that he is the Christ, the Son of the living God. So it matters what we believe about Jesus. Because if we, by the way, if you don't believe that Jesus is the Son of the living God, then why would you necessarily feel the need to listen to what his followers say? And that's kind of important because one of the things that a lot of people try to argue today is that when you look at what Jesus said, he was all about love and forgiveness and compassion and, 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 and there were a lot of rules with him. And so we shouldn't have to worry about that stuff until you start reading what Paul said. And some of the things that Paul says are pretty clear that there actually are some rules and some expectations for what Christians are supposed to do and be. Well, if you don't think that Jesus is God, then Paul's just some guy who was kind of making up some ideas about what Jesus said, and you don't have to listen to him either. But if Jesus is God, then presumably he can decide what his followers are going to write down, and if that's the case, then we actually have to listen. And it sort of changes the way that you approach the Scriptures if you understand it that way. So it matters what you believe about Jesus. And the final thing that's important, and this is a little bit tricky, is it matters how you believe. It matters where your belief comes from, I guess. I, I, I've frustrated it in terms of the questions, who, what, where, when, why. We're only going to do three. This is the last one, don't worry. Um, but it matters how you believe. What do I mean by that? Well, there's a guy named Blaise Pascal. Or there was a guy, he's dead. Uh, Blaise Pascal came up with this concept called Pascal's Wager. He was a mathematician, scientist, and also Christian. And Pascal's wager simply, and I'm refining this a little bit, or I'm simplifying this a little too much, but basically what he says is you've got two choices. You can either believe in God, or you cannot believe in God. And if you believe in God, then you're going to do the things that he said. If you don't believe in him, you're going to do whatever you want to. He says, but if we, if we approach this from a rational calculus, there's that math thing coming in. If you approach this from a rational calculus, then it makes more sense to believe in God than to not believe in God. Because if you, if you don't believe in God, yeah, you get to kind of do what you want to in this life, and that's fun for a while. But at the end of life, if God does exist, you're in real trouble. If God doesn't exist, you've missed, you, you know, you, you had some more fun than maybe the other guy did, but that's it. So if God doesn't exist, we all come to an end and, and there's nothing after that. And the Christian may have gone through a little bit more difficulty in his life, but it's just a fleeting sort of thing. Because on the other side of it, if God does exist, then if you were the guy who didn't believe, you're going to hell. That's bad. And if you guys did believe, then the things that you missed out on the fleeting pleasures of this life are going to be infinitely better and replaced by the things that you're going to have in eternity with God. So he says, there's a calculus that you can do here, and therefore it is better to obey God and try to come to belief in God than it is to not obey God, or to, to not believe in God. 
problem with this is that mathematics and religion or faith really don't really, they don't fit together very well. If, if the core of your belief is that I think it's a better bet that God exists than that he doesn't exist, you don't really have faith. You're just doing the math. And that's not what God wants. That's the, that's the same kind of thing as obedience, where obedience is just out of the fear of punishment, not out of any sort of desire to be obedient. That may get you, get you past your parents, but that's not okay with God. That was the main thing that Jesus kept criticizing the Pharisees for, is that you're obeying, but you don't need faith. You're just doing it because that's what you think you're supposed to do. It's not about faith. But belief is a necessity, and belief can't just be a calculation. Belief has to come from inside us. Mark chapter 9 tells the story of a man who is in a crowd and he comes, the, the, Jesus actually comes to the crowd after he's coming down from the transfiguration. And there's all this commotion going on. And Jesus is basically, what's going on here? And a man in the crowd says, teacher, I brought you my son possessed with a spirit which makes him mute. And whatever it seizes him, it slams him to the ground. He foams at the mouth and grinds his teeth and stiffens out. That is a messed up situation. Can you imagine what that would be like with the one of your children being in a situation like that? He says, I told your disciples to cast it out, and they could not do it. And he answered them and said, Oh, unbelieving generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I put up with you? Bring him to me. And when he saw him, immediately the spirit threw him into a convulsion. And falling to the ground, he began rolling around and foaming at the mouth. And he asked his father, How long has this been happening to him? And he said, From childhood. It has often thrown him both into the fire and into the water to destroy him. So this is... This is a really mean evil. I mean, evil spirit, so it's, it's evil. But this is a really mean one. It, it, like, it goes out of his way to make this guy's life miserable. Can you imagine having to deal with that as a parent? That kind, of, that kind of situation with your son. And the man says this, If you can do anything, take pity on us and help us. And I love Jesus' response. Jesus says, If you can? I, I, I imagine him saying it just about like that. Are you serious? Have you not seen the things that I can do? If you can, all things are possible to him who believes. All things are possible to him who believes. And I love the guy's response because it's a, it's, a, it's a response that comes straight out of a real search for faith because he says, immediately says, I do believe, help my unbelief. I believe, I just know that my belief isn't all the way where it's supposed to be yet. Help me get to that place. Help me get to the place where everything is possible. And of course, Jesus heals the son and sends him on his way. But here's the thing I want us to get out of this, the thing I want us to recognize. You can't believe for somebody else. You can't, you can't believe really hard for your children and expect that to matter. And by the same token, they can't have their belief based on what you believe just by itself. If that's all you've got, belief that somebody else's belief, because that's the way you've always done it, that's not really belief. Belief is an individual activity. Now we come together to strengthen our faith, to strengthen our belief, but if you don't have it to start with, I can't believe really, really hard and then you'll believe, or it'll fix it for you. You have to believe individually, you have to believe personally. And that's why Pascal's wager is so flawed, because ultimately what it's really saying is that even if you don't have belief, you should just obey, because that, in the calculus, that's the right thing to do. But Jesus says, if you don't have belief, things aren't possible anymore. All things are possible to him who believe, but if you don't have belief, well, you're kind of in trouble. And so belief is an individual activity. Paul says it this way in Romans chapter 10. The righteousness based on faith speaks as follows. Do not say in your heart, who will ascend into heaven, that is to bring Christ down, or who will descend into the abyss, that is to bring Christ up from the dead. He's highlighting two ideas here. Number one, the faith that's based, uh, righteousness based in faith doesn't need to go find Christ to get answers from him. And it also accepts that he is in heaven and that's where he is and he's not going to find him down in the abyss. But it's, it, it, but it's a faith that's not based on getting an immediate answer from somebody. It's a faith that's based in believing what God has said. It's just, what does it say? The word is near you, in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith which we are preaching that if you confess with your mouth Jesus as Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Faith is not, belief is not something that is in somebody else's heart. It's in your heart. It's got to be belief that you have that God raised Jesus from the dead. 
It's got to be a confession with your mouth. There's no, there's no second-hand faith, second-hand belief. You can raise your children and you can model your faith for your friends and your family, and that may bring them to belief, but it's always going to have to be their belief that gets them there, not yours. And Paul, and Paul finishes, he says this, For with the heart a person believes, resulting in righteousness, and with the mouth he confesses, resulting in salvation. The scripture says, whoever believes in him will not be disappointed. It's, it's individual. It's a person who believes. It's a person who confesses. It's whoever believes in him will not be disappointed. And it says this, There is no distinction between Jew and Greek, for the same Lord is Lord of all, abounding in riches for all who call on him, for whoever will call the name of the Lord will be saved. There's no getting around this. We work together as a, as a church. We are a family. We support each other. We, we mourn with each other. We correct each other when we go wrong. But at the end of the day, faith is an individual activity. It has to be something that comes from you. And what scares me sometimes is to think how many children we have baptized because of their parents' faith. You know, we, we, we talk in the church, we, we criticize, and rightly so, the notion of infant baptism, the notion of baptizing an infant, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> confirming them into the church in some way through trying to baptize an infant, because how can an infant possibly take responsibility for sins they don't even, haven't even committed and don't even understand? It's really just the faith of their parents being acted out on their behalf. But the fact is that I know so many of my contemporaries were baptized because their parents believed and they decided that they needed to do what their parents believed. And you know what? Most of them are not in the church anymore. Because if your faith is just your parents' faith, or your faith is just your friend's faith, or your spouse's faith, or whatever it is, if all your belief really stems from relationships with other people, other people will let you down. I, I hate to tell you that. If you haven't learned it already, you will. You're almost all older than I am. You surely learned it by now. People will let you down. And so if your faith is depending on how other people are affecting you, eventually that's going to fail. Eventually that's not going to work anymore. Our faith, our belief has to be individual. It has to be our belief. And so it matters how we believe. It matters that we internalize it. It matters that it's for us and not just because of someone else. Because without that personal, individual belief, you cannot be saved. And baptism is just an exercise in getting wet. And that's no good. So let's wrap this up. Over in Hebrews chapter 10, the Hebrew writer talks about this concept, the concept we've been looking at here. He says this, Therefore, brethren, since we have confidence to enter the holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way which he inaugurated for us through the veil, that is, his flesh, and since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a sincere heart and full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water, let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. The cool thing about being faithful to God is that God is always faithful to you. You don't ever have to worry that he's going to change his mind, that he's going to mess up, that he's not going to keep his promises, because God always keeps his promises. And like Jesus said, he can do anything. See, the, the, the reason a lot of times we don't keep our promises isn't even because we don't mean to, it's because we just can't for various reasons. Promise to go to your kid's little league game and then something happens at work or traffic happens or you, you know, whatever else it is, you literally can't get there. God is never going to make a promise that he can't fulfill because literally God can do anything. Plus, he knows what's going to happen, so if there was going to be a traffic accident that was going to keep him away, he would know about that, right? So God, God is never going to let you down. God is faithful. And so belief in God is the one safe thing that you can believe in. In this world, there is nothing else that you can believe. We talk about death and taxes. And the thing about death is that, you know, there's at least two people who have escaped death. And there will be more at the end of time. And taxes, there's a lot of people who don't pay their taxes. I hate to tell you that, but there are. There's no sure things, no safe, absolute safe bets or beliefs in this world except in God because God will never let you down. Because God is always faithful. And, and, and it's important to realize there's actually a little bit of a difference between belief and faith. We're going to talk about that more next week. We're going to look at Abraham in that context. But there's a difference between belief and faith, but ultimately what it really comes down to is that belief turns into faith when you do stuff about it. Faith is an acting belief. Demons believe, but they don't act on it, at least not the right way anyway. But 
Christians have faith because they act on their belief. They do something. But when you do something, when you have real belief, Jesus says, anything is possible. Everything is possible. Everything, everything is possible. That means that like the sin that you didn't think you would get rid of is possible to get rid of that because you believe. The, the messed up life that you have, it's not going to all fix itself overnight, but the things that are messing it up, it's possible to, to be done with those because you believe. This life that isn't so great some of the time, that we're all looking forward to getting done with, there's something better coming because you believe. All things are possible with those who believe because faith is the answer to those problems. Faith is the result or the thing that gets us to the result. And John says it this way. We're going to finish with this. John says, there was the true light which coming into the world enlightens every man. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, and the world did not know him. He came to his own, and those who were his own did not receive him. There was no faith there. There was no belief there among the Jews because they didn't recognize him for what he was, and they wouldn't accept him for what he claimed to be. But, but as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God. Even to those who believe in his name, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. Because all things are possible with God for those who believe. Let's stand and sing. I'm satisfied with just the cottage below. A little silver and a little gold. But in that city where the red will shine, I want a gold one that silver.